Good morning, everyone. Another wonderful day here in Austin, Texas, as I have somebody driving their loud car coming up my window. So that's always great for live uh, live broadcast stuff. Uh, today, I'm joined by Grant Hansen, who is a business uh, specialist, business strategist over at Recovery Club America. So appreciate you taking the time to join me today, Grant. Well, of course. Thanks for having me. So I uh, always kind of like to do a little bit of a origin background kind of uh, start to the podcast. I know a lot, a lot of people aren't originally from Austin or aren't originally from Texas and kind of how you um, one made your journey here to, to Austin and in maybe um, yeah, we'll kind of start there and kind of go from there. Okay. Yeah, no. So I, uh, I landed in Austin. Uh, in February of 2017, um, so I'm originally from Baytown, uh, Baytown, Texas, east side of Houston. Um, you know, born and raised there. Uh, ended up going out to Kerrville in 2014. Lived there for about three years, uh, and then made my way uh, over to Austin. A combination of relationships and, and business uh, brought me here, and I fell in fallen in love with with Austin. And, and definitely, uh, this is probably where I'm going to stay for for a long time. Yeah, that's why I tell a lot of people like, like I don't. There's no plan smooth. It'd have to be a very specific uh, reason to to want to move at that point, right? Like job opportunity, relationship kind of thing to really be like, oh yeah, I need to I need to leave because it's uh, got a lot of things going for it. So, um, and then tell us a little bit about Recovery Club America, um, since that's where you're currently working. So. So Recovery Club uh, came to me as an opportunity, kind of. I've been in the mental health and addiction space. I myself am a person in long-term recovery. I've uh, been sober about seven and a half years, a little bit, a little bit more now. Uh, and so that's that was kind of my introduction to that into that space. And I kind of started off in direct care, working. Uh, well, actually, I started as a dishwasher at a treatment center. And just kind of made my way up through, from, uh, you know, from there. So I've worked in a lot of different departments within the treatment programs and yada yada. And so. I progressed onto the business development side of things, which was a whole new venture for me. And that's where I developed a passion for business development and for uh, just, you know, an entrepreneurial seed really was planted. And so um, through 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 being able to help work with and, and build up several different types of programs, um, you know, something I've always been interested in is just innovation, right, in our space. And there's not enough of it, I don't think. Um, and so a good buddy of mine, when I left the hospital system that I was with prior to this, uh, he called me and he had been working with another that former CEO of a company to build this this product, this this product that we've launched, Recovery Club America. And uh, and he what he told me about it at first, and then he called me and said, "Man, we really love to bring you on on board and uh, and have you help us launch this thing." And when I when I got a full demo of the product, you know my but the, the concept was really cool. As I see a lot of times in treatment, people sometimes tend to equate different or new with better. And that isn't always necessarily, that's not always necessarily the case. And so the idea was nifty and I thought it was cool, but I just really wanted to dive more into it to see like, is this something that's actually going to work? Um, and and so the more we developed it, the more I got to even have input on the, the, the product development and all the services that we're going to incorporate inside of the app. The more I just fell in love with it, I said, "Man, this is huge. This is going to be huge." I think, and uh, and so yeah, man, we formally launched. I think in September or October, kind of a soft launch, and uh, and yeah, we've had we've had a lot of cool successes. We've gotten to work with a lot of cool people, and and just a simple explanation of what Recovery Club is: it's a it's a web based platform. It's an app that you can download, and it's all virtual. Um, everything can be done and accessed via via the platform. Um, and it functions almost like a social media platform and with a community that is completely centered around uh, mental health and substance use. And so there's a lot of subscription based services you can access within it, but you don't have necessarily have to. Um, and so we're partnering with treatment programs and companies and et cetera, but it's also for everyday people just who need some, need some extra support uh, on their mental health journey, you know, and everybody in between. Nice. Yeah. Uh almost all industries uh, have been evolving uh, and, and always need to evolve and change. But at the same time, there's always that pull to go to the shiny new object and think that somehow it's going to be better than methods that are a lot of times tried and true, right? And so 
it's definitely a balance right. of pushing the industry forward, but also making sure you do what works because that's the only way you're going to stay in business. Right. Have you right. guys, I mean, I mean, obviously the last few years have been kind of crazy when it comes to um, mental health and some of those things that I don't feel like have been talked on personally, don't feel like they've been talked enough about during this pandemic. Um, that definitely have been some, but it's definitely kind of seemed like it's taken a back step to, to other things. Uh, and while we're in an era, era where, I mean, you mentioned 10 years ago, 10 years ago, met, you know, those mental health and things were talked about even less. So it's definitely awesome that we've progressed so much in the last 10 years, but how have you seen that change say since the pandemic when I'm, when all studies and information kind of show that there's been a rise of those types of uh, issues because of the extra stress that have been put on people? Right. No, that's a perfect question. Um, and I think that what people aren't as quick to see or recognize is that there's been a lot of really good progressions that have that have come as a result. And it's kind of a bittersweet thing, right? Because for any of these changes to happen, something bad has to happen first, right? So we saw first we saw it's like a 600 percent increase in call volume for the suicide prevention hotline almost overnight. Um, and so that's just one example. And there's all these other things. And so what started happening was something that's happening in all industries and definitely should have already happened in mental health long before this was just virtual access, access, ways to access these types of resources virtually. And what we found out was I remember talking to a friend of mine um, several years back who was doing telehealth trauma therapy really before telehealth was actually like a thing, a popular mm -hmm. thing. Um, and I remember her telling me that Grant, there's a, there's an entire population of people who I see now who have never accessed treatment before, who probably never would have accessed treatment until they could do so virtually because they feel safe and they can do it at their home, in their bed, in their pajamas. They don't even have to turn their camera on if they want to. Mm -hmm. There is already people working on developing completely virtual reality driven residential treatment program experiences, you know? And so... There's been so much good that's come, I think, but it's, it's as a result of all of the all of the bad. I mean, there's, you're right. The, the, the mental health repercussions have not been discussed enough, but it's such a political climate that it's tough. To, you know what I mean? It's just how it is, is, unfortunately. But I stay out of that realm and stick to what I can do and what I do best. Uh, and that's not that's not politics. You know, um, I think if people would understand that those types of things like for instance decisions about how we treat mental health and, and drug addiction from a criminal standpoint from a clinical standpoint those decisions are made locally those decisions are made on a state and local level and if people would i think at the very least and this is all i'll say about that if people would get more involved in their local politics if they care about things like that that's where those kind of decisions uh, are made for sure yeah no it's like you say the technology has obviously increased across again all kinds of industries um, out of necessity over the last few years and i do you know when, when we talk to people about the challenges of the pandemic whether you know they be on someone's business or you know personal life and, and, and things of that nature i do always try to have at least the positive outlook that at least it happened now right like 20 years ago you and i wouldn't be able to have a video chat you know mm -hmm. which while that would be okay for you and me not to have, but like I wouldn't be able to video chat friends or family right. or those kind of things if you were really stuck at home. And so um, not that that diminishes the impact that and stress that, that all this stuff has had on people, but the fact that it could have happened at a point in time where you would have had to pay long distance charges to call someone. And now you just jump on your phone and right. can FaceTime and Skype somebody and, and kind of do virtual happy hour and different things. So um it's it's right. unfortunate that 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 we've had to have some of these challenges to push stuff forward as fast as we have. But again, there are um, hope you know good things coming out of it and good things that will be effective moving forward too. Absolutely. So you mentioned for yourself that you know you've been you said about ten years um, from recovery. Do you do you, are you okay sharing a little bit more about that story or? So what, yeah, so, I mean, I guess, you know, what kind of, 
how I guess break you know, maybe kind of maybe a little bit of the origin of that kind of situation too. Cause again, I think talking about it and understanding that other people have had similar experiences is a huge step in letting people know they're not alone. Cause that's what I think happens for a lot of people, right? Especially if it's a suicide kind of thing, right? Like you, most people that commit suicide, it's because you feel you're alone. And so understanding that other people are actually going through the same thing. Other people, a lot of times are putting up a facade that they may seem like things are going well, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. So um, love for you to kind of share more of your story for that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I'm glad you said that um, because, you know, I feel fortunate um, to say that I, I ended up being becoming what I would consider a, a non-functioning drug addict, right? There's, we, we kind of use those terms functioning, non-functioning. I use that term loosely. Um, but there are definitely those of us who, once we start to engage in behaviors like that, we just start to lose everything. That's just how it is for whatever reason. I lost my freedom a couple of times. I went to prison. I was homeless, all those things. And that just was my experience. That's not everybody's experience. And what happens is I feel like I see those who are insulated with this false sense of I have things, I've able to maintain a job, I've been able to keep my family intact somehow, I, I have a couple of cars and a house and those things and they're insulated by that and they, they think, well, it must not be that bad or I wouldn't have these things. And those are the ones who end up dying, to be honest with you, because it's, it's not as obvious, it's not quite as obvious that there's a problem. You know, for me, especially once I got around to finally getting sober, there was no questioning. I couldn't look at my experience and question whether or not there was a problem. There was obviously a problem, you know, like, and so I was very fortunate in that. And I was very fortunate that it happened to me when I was that young, you know, thank goodness. Some people go their whole lives and end up going through this, what I'm going, what I went through when they're in their fifties and sixties, you know, and, and that was, that's the, that was the real tragedy, you know, um, and so, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You never know what's going on. And I, and I actually, at this point, I'm convinced that everybody should be engaged in some form of therapy, some form of peer support, some form of accountability, something like that. Um, because I feel like what happens is I was talking about this to somebody yesterday and you know, I started going back to therapy again myself because I've seen some things that have cropped up in my own life, my own behaviors that I that I don't that I find objectionable. And there's just people who immediately jump to like, well, why do you need to go to therapy? Like, why don't you just talk to it? And I'm like, you know, that's the thing, man, is that even the people who do believe in therapy, a lot of times they feel like they have to wait till things get as bad as they can possibly be before they'll finally do something. And that's the huge mistake. That's the huge mistake that feeling like you should only wait until things are that bad to finally do something when the idea should really be to engage in that kind of stuff ahead of time so that it never gets that bad in the first place. You know, um, there, and people there's don't, nothing, there's nothing people else. don't want to do that. There's nothing else that you would do that you can, that I can think of where you, where you think that would be how you would handle it. Like you wouldn't decide, I'm just going to wait till I get way out of shape and way overweight and then i'll then i'll decide to go to the gym or you know i'm gonna wait till my car i'm never gonna take my car in for service until it literally can't you know move and then i'll finally take it in to to get stuff right. done right like there's right. in almost everything we do in life there's the kind of preventative maintenance to keep things going along the way and like you mentioned there's a lot of people that really that do have a form of therapy whether it's going to the gym going out to drinks with friends, you know, family, all, all different kinds of things exactly. there too. So it makes it easier to not have to do something as formal as therapy for a lot of people. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad idea to do a lot sooner rather than later. And again, I think for a lot of people, yeah. it comes down to, um, it comes down to shame, maybe too strong of a word, but you know, not wanting to feel like they're less than someone else who isn't going to therapy when in reality, most hardly anyone ever mentions if they are or not. So you don't know if they're doing it. It, it comes in the form of comparing yourself to others, which is always hurtful because you're never going to, there's no reason to compare yourself to others. You're not like anybody else. Exactly. 
No, you're 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 exactly right about that, and and I even still find myself, but I've just I've taken a stance of curiosity when I find myself getting stuck in those in those old belief systems, even even around not wanting to talk about therapy and that kind of stuff. I have to ask myself, well, what is it? Why is that? You know, like and just taking that taking that attitude of when these things crop up, and, and this is something I was talking about with my therapist, not being judgmental towards them, but just asking yourself, well, why is this? And is this the belief that's actually serving me? Or is it just something that was handed to me by somebody else? And, and, and do I need to consider dismantling it? You know, um, and these are all, it's a journey. It is not something that happens overnight. And that's what people want. They want a quick fix, an overnight fix. And the thing I've learned the most about personal development and growth, especially since getting sober, is it's not a sprint. It's a marathon that I am sure will last for the rest of my life. I will never stop growing in that way. I hope. I hope. I'm, I, I'm sure you will. And like, you know, again, similar to other activities too, right? You don't, um, as someone who likes health and fitness, right? Like you don't expect to go to the gym for a week or a month and be like, eh, good. I'll, I'll be good for the rest of my life now because I went to, the, went to the gym for a month Ooh. or, yeah. uh, you, you know, diets, right? Like yeah, everyone yeah. wants to fix on a diet, but in reality, you're much better off, uh, finding a lifestyle and habit that you can continue because, you know, you hope, you know, hopefully you're going to live 40, 50, 80 more years. And so if you can only keep up with the diet or with the fitness plan or with the therapy session for, uh, or, or being in a good mental space for a month or two, well, that's a very small fraction of the amount of time that you hopefully have left. Right. Absolutely. So you hit rock bottom which while again you would never wish that on anyone was at least more eye-opening right like again it, it was very stark as far as like hey here, here's where things are i can very easily equate to wh how i got here um what what was the was there a moment or kind of situation that um led to kind of coming rising rising back from all that so so what, um, this is a question that I get asked um, a lot, and it's often asked to me by families, families of people that I've gotten to work with, right? Grant, what was it that finally, like, because they just want answers, you know, they want to know, how, what can I do to help my loved one get there, you know, and Grant, what was the thing that finally made you change? And that's such a tricky question, because it's hard for me to say what it takes for any other person. Like, I'm not inside any other person's mind. I don't know what that breaking point is or that moment is. I can say that it, sure, it certainly has some something to do with my external conditions, for sure. But the most concise way I can ever describe it is to say that it was a complete and total collapse of ego, which which just involved this moment where because I was very stubborn, like everything I had to feel like everything was my own idea. You know, like to get sober, I had to feel like that was my idea. To do any of that stuff, I couldn't. I I could not feel like somebody else was nudging me. And that's not the case for everybody. But for me, I just couldn't feel like that. I had to feel like I came to that decision on my own. And I had a series of these moments, right? But the thing is, is, is that, that the ego tends to reconstruct itself pretty quickly, at least in, 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 our, in our people. <laughs> you know, you have this complete collapse, this moment, this epiphany where you're like, wow, no matter what I do, my life keeps getting worse. Like, I might need help. But if you don't act on that moment pretty quickly, I find that that window closes pretty rapidly. And, uh, and and all of a sudden your ego reconvinces you that it really wasn't that big of a deal and that you're probably overreacting anyways. And so is everybody else, you know, and, uh, and yeah, I just I, uh, I had this moment where I just realized that I was literally operating on a daily basis, doing things against my own will, doing things that were so far outside my moral compass and they were so incongruent with what I was with my my own morals and values and I couldn't live up to them. I, I, it was impossible. And I said, okay, I can't. I'm literally incapable of doing this by myself at this point. I don't know what else to do. And when you're at that moment of just complete, like, I give up, mm -hmm. man, it's like, what a freeing, like, how, how liberating, because you can just, you can give up that pride and ego and that, that I have to do this all on my own because it's gone. It's obvious you can't, <laughs> obviously. So why not, you know? Man, that was a moment that was just a launching pad. All of a sudden, you have all the options in the world now because you've just, you have no options left, right? The irony, 
the irony of that is is what happened. And uh, I got started getting into some work really quickly and, and, and heavily because my life quite literally depended on it. Yeah. So then from kind of beco- um, becoming sober, then have you always spent your time working in the recovery space trying to, you know, that was that, I guess, what drew you to wanting to do that other than I'm assuming from helping people having lived through that experience. But uh, there are obviously a lot of people who, when they go through that, you know, go back into other fields and stuff. So what kind of prompted you to want to uh, join that space uh, full time? Yeah. Well, so honestly, I tried not to at first um, because it was a very cliche thing to me for people to get sober and want to become like a counselor or something. Right. It was like this is super cliche thing that I was just not going to do. And I kind of just got called into it. I feel like, you know, I tried to do a few other things for about a year or so, not quite. And then I, I finally uh, applied for this job, Washington, well, I applied for a different job at the treatment center, but I hadn't been sober long enough, so they stuck me in the kitchen. And that was really a blow to my ego a little bit. But I just had my pep talk myself and every day. And it, cause I was like literally 14 hour days working in that kitchen, five, six days a week sometimes, you know, and I had a baby coming at the time. So, I just had to give myself a pep talk, like, this is just where you're starting. This is just the beginning. Like, it's okay. I got to pay my dues. And I would have to tell myself that, like, it's okay. Um, and as I progressed, I didn't know what I wanted to do inside that space. A lot of it changed and evolved over time, which is advice I give to people, you know what I mean, all the time. It's what you what you wanted to do two or three years ago may not be what you want to do or be now. And, and you'll figure that out as you go. Um, and I had opportunities and I tried different things. And I somewhere along this this path, this entrepreneurial seed got planted in me, and I realized I also wanted to do well for myself. I have financial goals that are that are big and ambitious, you know, and and I've been really obsessed with trying to figure out a way that I can marry that with my passion for helping people in this space, and uh, and I love I love to do it because I'm obsessed with human potential. It's just crazy to me when you really think about how insane it is that somebody can go from the lowest of the low and if they're willing to do the work whatever work that might be they can literally do and become anything that they want from from wherever they start doesn't even doesn't matter and that's so crazy to me it's so crazy to me and i'm obsessed with helping people figure out how to do that no the the mind is uh amazing but also um can be amazingly frustrating as well too right and the fact that again similar to when someone's going through the lows you a lot of times can't convince them that what how what they're doing is hurting them right because they're in their mind it's not as big of a deal and on the reverse side of things uh there's a, a lot of people who don't realize their full potential even if they're not truly hurting themselves from like a substance abuse kind of thing, but don't realize how great they can be because of the limiting beliefs um, they have or the lack of confidence and some of those things that were instilled in them, uh, you know, through school or through different things as well, too. So it's the, the mind is, is amazing, and especially if you can start to unlock the, its potential. Right. Right. I mean, it's exactly to your point. It's, you know, there, there was such a, uh, a seemed like a huge parallel between what I was learning as I was getting sober in the rooms of recovery and 12 step philosophy and all that and other things I became exposed to working in the industry. And then when I started to get into the entrepreneurial space and personal development and I started listening to people like Jim Rohn and Tony Robbins and all these other speakers, and I started to see these huge similarities. And I was like, you know, the same things that's preventing an entrepreneur from being able to be successful, the root causes of some of those things, at least, are, are not much different than the same than the things that drive somebody to drink and, and use drugs. It's just the, what's happening at the root is similar, but how it manifests itself out here in terms of behaviors is, is can be very different. But it's it's really not all that different. You know, it's really not. Obviously, we're afflicted with something that could kill us. That's that's a big difference. That's a grave yeah. issue. but. But, but but if you remove that aspect of it, it's like everybody has their their own ways of coping with these same things, and they're all different for different people, you know. And so I was like, man, I can really see this coming together like like really well because I see people get sober, and it's great, they're sober. But now what? 
now you're sober, but then let's let's keep, you know what I mean? How, how, how can we take that same energy you just had to put into to defeating a deadly illness, can you put that same energy into like now the next chapter and then the chapter after that? You know what I mean? And that's something that I've just really been intrigued and, and obsessed with figuring out. Yeah, very nice. With um, so with Recovery America, it's a uh, the company is here based in Austin. Well, so actually, there's a there's a team of us that are split between Tennessee, Brentwood, Tennessee, and and Austin. And so, yeah, I think technically it's actually headquartered out of out of Tennessee. Right. There's a few of us here right now, but we're covered in I think twenty something states at this point. And obviously doing all it's through your guys, you guys have an app, you said, or website that allows you to connect with people. Correct. Yeah. Is So you can download it. Just Recovery Club America, either in the App Store or the Google Play Store. You can download it uh, for free. And that's what we're really trying to push for right now is just for the free downloads, not even necessarily subscription services. If people find them useful and want to engage in them, great. But there's a lot of free things that people can do and engage with uh, in the app. And... If you want to remain anonymous, you don't have to even use your real name. You can use an alias uh, if you'd like to. And, you know, I just we're because we, we need feedback. So we're encouraging people to get on, download the app, interact, engage with whatever they find interesting and, and give us feedback on things that we can add, take away, improve, make better. We have an impressive back end support team, which is constantly trying to improve things. And, you know, so that's I think that's what separates us significantly in the marketplace is we have such tremendous back-end support and an amazing team that is doing everything behind the scenes. Nice. Do you know from, uh, it, so if someone's thinking about doing it but wants to do it anonymous, anonymously, do you know how that works with their, so usually they're having to download it through Google Play or Apple Play, and usually those accounts aren't necessarily anonymous. So I mean, that may be a more technical question than you generally deal with and stuff. But for someone who maybe is yeah. concerned about that from an anonymity standpoint, do you know how that works? Well, I mean, that would be the same thing if they were to engage in any other, like if they were to download, you know, uh, BetterHelp or Talkspace or any of that stuff, you know, it would still be, it would be HIPAA compliant in terms of confidentiality between, okay. you know what I mean? But but the same issue would apply there too. I don't. Sure. I don't even know how you would necessarily get around something like that. Yeah, and I see. I don't know that it would necessarily prevent someone like because you know the username and how you sign up through the app is usually kind of the bigger thing for most people. But it was just something that kind of dawned on me for some. If someone was really trying, if you know, again yeah. dealing dealing with something that they really you know kind of don't want exposed, uh, even though that even though exposing it's probably going to be the best way for them to get help. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's where they're at in their journey. <laughs> right, right. Nice. So what's kind of the, uh, you know, so getting more, getting more downloads, getting more users, so that way you can kind of um, continue growing the app. How long have, has the business and app been, um, been viable? So, yeah, so launch, it was in like September, October. Um, we had a few uh, programs in like sober homes and that kind of stuff be part of our pilot program, which was successful. Uh, a lot of them came on board as full-time accounts and, and a lot of them are even requiring it now for, for, their, for their, uh, you know, their clients or their residents in their sober homes. And so it's, uh, it's something that is like, you know, we're, we're creating partnerships with treatment programs, but we're also meeting with EAPs, employee assistance programs, right, with HR departments and companies to be a resource. Um, we're meeting with, with, with jail systems and, and probation departments and, uh, and court systems, you know, veterans courts even. We've gotten some, some, some opportunities there to be the resource. So there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of, that's the great thing about being a digital product. It is so easy for us to create new services when we when we see the need arise for something, we can create it. We can create it, you know. And we, what we've been able to create and what we can offer at the affordability is sixty eight dollars a month. If you subscribe to the other services, sixty eight bucks a month, you get up to f from four to eight sessions a month with a recovery coach, access to process groups, focus groups, and then there's tons of content, games, and challenges, and etc. You know, it's sixty eight. Traditional recovery coaching is usually one to two grand a month minimum and you're signing a six 12 month contract usually you know and so the idea was not only to increase the 
the continuum, the aftercare from people who are getting out of residential treatment, but to be something that can be literally accessible any to anybody anywhere that could not previously access services. Only 11% of people annually, by the way, who need access to substance use or mental health treatment actually get it, actually get it. Which is not, not a good percentage at all. So yeah, no, again, making it, making it easier, right? We, as we, we're well, well aware of every, everything in our life seems to be getting easier, whether it's buying clothes through Amazon or um, any, you know, any number of activities, having your groceries delivered through Instacart. Um, the ease of use right. is obviously a huge thing, but also again, the, the cost barrier to entry can be a big thing too, because unfortunately, um, in a lot of cases, again, especially during a time like the pandemic here, some of the people probably, I would guess, definitely don't know this necessarily, but the, probably a higher percentage of low-income people who had this additional stress of losing their service service jobs and those kind of things um, probably were hit more harder Um from a mental health space and uh, abuse space than um, people that got to just, you know, work from home five days a week in their tech job. Not that, again, not that there's pl not plenty of uh, potential issues there, but uh, it's nice that you have a lower cost entry for people, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and the idea too, just I'll, I'll say this too, is that even though the product is virtual and intended to be accessed virtually, there's a cool feature on there where you can find and locate members that are near you. So I don't want it. I don't want it to be misunderstood that the important, the in-person connections are still vital. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't mean that virtual should needs to take the place of, but that it should be a, a means to an end, if possible. You know, that you can access those services virtually, but that you can actually connect with and meet up with. Because we'll have events that we'll be launching. Other other organizations that will be posted that are friendly to mental health and addiction that will be hosting their events and posting them inside of our platform, you know, all that stuff. So there's lots of opportunities for people to get on there and just even if they never spend a dollar on the services to immediately connect with and engage with and build relationships with tons of people who are super committed to uh, to, to, the, to their mental health. Very awesome. And so you mentioned again, right, it's Re, uh, Recovery Club America. Would be the place to go i do have the right. instagram uh, page as well too which i'm sure has a link to get downloaded the app and stuff as well um yeah. and then uh if is your instagram or facebook kind of the best way for people to reach out if they have questions themselves yeah absolutely they can reach out to me either facebook or instagram i do uh i do typically respond to messages and all that so yeah anytime nice well, I really appreciate you taking the time to to jump on and, and kind of talk about it. It's a very important subject to talk about and, and needs to be talked about more. And so being able to share your story is, I think, an awesome thing to help people know that they're not alone. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for having me. I was uh, I felt really fortunate to get this connection, man. So grateful. Appreciate it. Uh, everyone have a wonderful Tuesday. Mm -hmm.